Good morning. Welcome uh, to this open session of the PAC. We start with the first presentation uh, given by Richard Milner uh, for a proposal about spin-dependent electron scattering from a polarized helium-3 target in class 12. Please, Richard, go ahead. Good morning, Marcus from Boston. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the class 12 collaboration, my co-spokespersons, Harut, James, and Yen, I'd like to prevent, uh, present you the overview of this proposal. And I want to start with the context. So this originated in a realization by James Maxwell and I within the last year that a technical development that we had uh, carried out uh, in connection with the BNL MIT collaboration um, had relevance uh, for, for class 12. And uh, the work at Brookhaven is to develop a polarized helium-3 ion source for RIC and ultimately for EIC. Um, using actually an existing source which has a, a five tesla solenoidal field. And this work has been in progress since 2012. It employs, uh, our proposal employs an established target technology which was developed at Caltech in the late 80s. Uh, it's a cryogenically cooled uh, metal target cell in diffusive contact with a glass pumping cell. Uh, this was developed in the group of Bob McEwen. I was a, it was a principal focus of, of myself as a postdoc, and this was used successfully at Bates in the late 80s, early 90s, with 25 microamps of electron beam. And uh, the PhD theses of Haiyan Gao at Caltech, Nola Hansen at MIT, were written on this work. Our proposed target would be located directly in the five Tesla central solenoid of class 12. And so the idea is to take advantage of this beautiful, uh, fantastic detector with all its capabilities. We assume a uh, 10.6 GeV polarized electron beam and an intensity of half a microamp in Hall B, uh, which allows a luminosity uh, of 2.7 times 10 to 34 nucleons per square centimeter per second. Our proposal here requests 30 pack days and is focused on longitudinally polarized uh, helium-3 with spin-dependent DIS and CITUS with two main physics goals, to look at the PT dependence of the neutron longitudinal spin structure and to investigate the nuclear effects in CITUS process more generally. Uh, we want to say that the measurements we're proposing, we believe, complement the approved Class 12 program on ND3. Uh, they're also complementary to the ongoing and the planned CEOP experiments, and we believe uh, can strengthen the science case for the proposed solid spectrometer, the future spectrometer. So we're, we're, the purpose here is to add value to the existing JLab science agenda. Just to remind you, polarized helium-3 for close to 30 years has been an effective polarized neutron target for scattering experiments. Uh, it's been crucial for direct study of neutron spin structure, but I would point out, if you go to the particle data book, you will see nice data on the proton. You actually see nice data on the deuteron, but you don't see any figure on the neutron. And it seems to me that uh, this is one of the goals of the, certainly the JLab program and future EIC program is to correct this. However, helium-3 is, is really a nucleus. It's a light nuclear system. It has an EMC effect. There are beautiful data from JLab that show that, but it's calculable. And it's, it's a different nucleus to the deuteron, and in that sense, uh, the, they, they may, the, the two together in the same detector um, raise very interesting possibilities. Most importantly, uh, I want to point out that all the experiments over the 30 years have been done with targets at low magnetic field. So at Jefferson Lab, there's been a very successful spin exchange optical pumping uh, program, CEOP which has been fantastic, uh, lots of experiments done, lots of experiments approved and planned. However, we point out that polarized helium-3 targets have never been used in Hall B. And this technology uh, is generally not available uh, for, to use in a, in a high field. And there are technical reasons for that. So this other technique, uh, metastability exchange, operates at a much lower pressure, has been used in Im imaging and neutron scattering, and as I said, was the basis for this target, which uh, was used at Bates down to 11 Kelvin to increase the density. And the new development that uh, has motivated this is that we now uh, can do this uh, optical pumping in high magnetic field. This technique was originated at Ecole Normale in Paris by uh, the group of Pierre John uh, Nache and company. And uh, it basically allows higher fields and also higher polarization, but more importantly, at higher pressures 
do you see there a plot of polarization at 100 millibar uh, of order 60 percent? So we, we took this technology starting in 2012 uh, at MIT and in collaboration with Brookhaven have adapted it for this source. Uh, this has been reviewed uh, and has favorably been reviewed with high priority. It was highlighted in the National Academy report on ESC science. This figure comes from that. So it's, a five, it's, it's doing optical pumping in a confined space within a 5,000 solenoid. And one reaches high polarizations, actually, uh, We've published a paper where polarizations of over 80%, uh, but certainly 50% uh, at 100 millibar seems, has been done, has been proven. So the concept is to combine this high field uh, technique with the double cell cryo target that was developed at Caltech, and to basically um, increase the density by about a factor of 6,000. So then you get a target thickness, which is a, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not going to put the CEOP target out of business, but it's, it's, it's getting there in terms of thickness. And the great advantage is that you can polarize directly within a 5,000 solenoid. And so the idea is to configure the helium-3 gas in a 20 centimeter long aluminum cell and to coat the wall, the, coat the wall with hydrogen. And we have a detailed uh, design report that we were in the process of preparing for publication. So again, this is some more detail. This is what it looks like in class uh, 12, beam coming from the left, this, this target system is located within the central solenoid uh, parameters, and we have 25 micron uh, aluminum foil windows that have to be uh, taken into account as well. So, um, I mean, the project, the big work is, is something we have to do, which is to develop this, and James Maxwell uh, lead this uh, with support from the JLab target group would be done at Jefferson Lab with Hall B support and obviously the active collaboration of my group and, and likely other collaborators. And the major equipment are offline to configure a magnet cooling system and, and basically build a target offline uh, that would fit within the class 12 solenoid. Of course, then the issue is uh, one needs to uh, put beam on it and um, test the, the beam depolarization. This was done extensively for the Caltech target, but it was all at low field. And uh, basically, uh, this has to be done at high field. So the idea is if we do this, then we can locate it directly in, in, in the center of this, uh, of the class 12 detector. So the assumptions we make are 10.6 uh, GV, the maximum current uh, allowed by the present um, Ball B um, infrastructure, which is half a microamp, beam polarization of 80%, and then the target thickness with a polarization of 50%, and the luminosity in helium-3 is 0.9 times to the 34, 30 pack days. And everything I show you uh, the, is based on these assumptions. And the idea is we're interested to study TMD part on distributions and longitudinal spin. So just to remind you about the basic process, uh, CITIS is fundamental to understanding and imaging nucleon-nucleon structure. And there, I think the theory review uh, gave a comprehensive uh, perspective from their point of view that when the, there are lots of issues with respect to the theoretical description at JLab Energies. However, we, we do point out that a lot, most JLab data are actually in, in reasonable agreement with higher energy data and with the standard uh, Monte Carlo. And that, that is not to sweep theoretical issues under the rug, but from an experimental point of view, um, it seems tractable. And I think the point is that new measurements are essential to make progress, uh, as well as theory. Of course, we need a theory, but one needs new measurements. So we have um, made a logarithmic binning, 28 bins in X, 28 bins in Q squared. And so this is DIS in 30, day, 30 pack days, and it's 780 million events. And I think the previous best experiment was like 200 million at Slack, it, just inclusive events. So um, by some factor, uh, the precision is, is unprecedented. And of course, with high precision inclusive, you get high ra uh, rate of, of CITUS events. This shows you the E prime pi plus, and this is with a Z cut of point three, Z point three higher and 114 million events. So the standard, uh, did this uh, kinematic um, plane, or the, the two planes, the scattering plane, the hadron production plane, and then the, the phi angle between them. And the point is this class 12 spectrometer has been designed to do high precision multivariable 
did his measurements in all these variables on the neutron. In the usual uh, Lorenz invariant, T squared, X burkane, and Z. And the kinematic coverage of the proposal is X from 0.05 to 0.7, Q squared of 1 to 9, Z of 0.2 to 0.9, and PT up to 0.3. And the cross section is expressed in, a, in the standard nomenclature of polarizations and beam and target times F functions, which are labeled depending on the polarizations, and then the sign dependence is added explicitly. So this shows you a binning of, of the pi plus events in X, Q squared, Z, and PT, um, with really large coverage, as I said. So now we have this large uh, statistics. What does it mean from the physics point of view? What does it mean for the structure of a neutron? So to that end, we have uh, made calculations. We've taken a lattice QCD calculation of Moosh et al., and we've used a uh, KT dependence given by Ansel Mino, which is Gaussian, given by these factors. And the Fs that I previously showed you are basically pro products of these um, parton distributions time fragmentation functions. And what we're after is the PT dependence of the double spin asymmetry to get at the KT dependence of the polarized quarks. So this, using that model, this is our, proje our projection for pi plus and pi minus on statistical uncertainties, which are really uh, impressively small, certainly up to PT of one. As you get to higher PT, then the errors start to increase. And so the goal is to take precision data and obviously work with theory to understand uh, the structure. Um, we've actually, uh, and Harut is the one who's driven this, um, made a model to try and understand the sensitivity to the D quark structure. So this is a parton model, again, with KT distributions, which are Gaussian, and know basically what we know about UD and delta U, delta D with uncertainties. And on the bottom left, you can see the KT square dependence uh, for the D quark, the, the polarization of the D quark on the left for the neutron, on the right for the proton. And not surprisingly, if you measure the neutron directly, then you access the polarization of the D quark with, with a smaller uncertainty by about a factor of five uh, compared to the proton data, which would be very interesting. What's also interesting is actually the U quark um, extraction in, in the neutron is you know, maybe a factor of three worse than the proton. So there's actually a lot of cross-checking you can do if you have the neutron as well as the proton. And of course, the deuteron as well, eventually. This shows you um, the pro projections for the X dependence, uh, basically using standard assumptions about the parton distributions and the fragmentation, um, where um, we show Hermes data for comparison, and the red uh, are the projected really small error bars, um, where now one is integrating, of course, over PT and phi. So again, this comes from the amazing statistical precision. Um, we've considered the Collins fragmentation for a longitudinally polarized target. I guess this is, uh, my understanding, this is named the Kotzinian Muller's asymmetry. And we used, uh, the, for comparison, this is again a lattice calculation here of the KT dependence from Agler, Moosh, uh, John Negley, and Andrea Schaefer. And uh, you see a standard dipole where there's a shift of about 60 MeV. And again, using that, uh, we made a prediction for the AUL asymmetry, the sine 2 phi. And you know, the asymmetry is rather small, or on the order of 1%, but it changes sign. And this is a direct access to transversely polarized quarks in a longitudinally polarized neutron, which we're really uh, excited about. Kind of zooming out more generally, uh, pointing out that, again, the CITES process is fundamental to the scientific ag agenda of JLab and also the electron ion collider. We typically and naively describe it in terms of a plane wave approximation, then and then a simple convolution of nucleon and subnucleon degrees of freedom. But of course, you know, if you think about it for 10 seconds, um, there are known processes that violate this. Probably the most straightforward is final state effects, and this is being calculated. And the theorists are actually um, have made progress. There's a, a generalized Eichelon approximation, and what they find are you know not huge effects, but uh, we, we think this is really important to, uh, to start to study in a quantitative way to take data. And again, comparing the deuteron and helium-3 in the same um, class 12 with spin uh, is just unprecedented and really uh, should, together with theory, offer uh, really 
important advances and insights that you know we can be pursued with solid or with EAC later. Okay, turning to experimental systematic uncertainties, I think the beam polarization is known uh, rather well and can be reversed quickly. The target polarization based on the previous running at Bates, uncertainty of five, plus or minus 5% and reversal something like every six hours seems reasonable. And so, you know, the, the errors are, are of order 8% in the asymmetries that we would, that we would extract. The technical review requested a Jeon 4 calculation of Mahler scattering, and this was carried out by my student Sang Baek Lee using the full uh, <clears throat> class Monte Carlo and full reconstruction. And the conclusion was that the drift chamber occupancy is less than 3% for all sectors. So the conclusion is longitudinally polarized helium-3 with half a microamp. <clears throat> That's comparable background Mahler, certainly from Mahler's, to running with liquid hydrogen at about 80 nanos. So I wanted to just uh, address the beam current. We we had originally you have five minutes left, Richard. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, we had originally proposed 2.5 microamps, but as was pointed out in the technical review, uh, to reach that would require considerable development in the hall. So um, we considered 0.5 microamps, and that's what we've assumed. And I just want to give you the considerations that entered into that. Uh, so at 0.5 microamps, this increases the statistical uncertainties over the original proposal by the square root of five. Um, however, I think I've shown you uh, at 0.5 microamps, what we propose still has unprecedented statistical precision. Um, the major effect really is at the highest uh, PT bins, Z bins. However, you know, when we look at the predictions for the asymmetries, which we've made, um, they're somewhat uncertain. And, um, you know, it's very hard to uh, either way to argue that uh, when you know, we, we, could have, we could have asked for more beam time, but we didn't feel that, that we felt that, that 0.5 microamps with 30 pack days was optimal at this time. And we point out that, you know, if we, if we get a go ahead, a scientific go ahead, and we actually get to build a target, it's going to take us more than two to three years. Uh, maybe we'll be more informed. <laughs> we'll certainly work on the, on the calculations and the theorists. We also point out that reducing the beam current has actually the effect of both reducing beam depolarization. It's, it's now half a microamp, and we took data in 1993 at 25 microamps of Bates, so that's 50, factor of 50 reduction, and also backgrounds, of course, are less. So we carefully considered it, and um, you know, we feel, based on everything else, all considerations, that this is the optimal current. So our request is 30 pack days, uh, polarized electron beam, at the highest operating energy, which we believe is 10.6, the highest available intensity for the foreseeable future, which is 0.5 microamps, and a polarization value of 0.8 in Hall B, and the class spectrometer would be operated in the standard configuration. So uh, in, in summary, um, we believe that over the coming decades, pol the polarized helium-3 nucleus, which sits at the interface of nucleon and calculable light nuclear systems, will be a rich mine of insight. I mean, the, the EIC is getting ready for that. Rick is, we're working on a source for Rick. Uh, and so we think Jefferson Lab has, you know, important role to play and is playing, of course, with the existing experiments that are already planned. However, we feel, you know, it's anomalous that, that Hall B in class 12 does not have a polarized helium-3 target. We don't see any good reason why that should be the case. So we feel our proposed, our proposal, uh, uh, addresses that anomaly and offers really an unprecedented ability to, to utilize the class 12 spectrometer for these studies. Our proposal here requests 30 pack days focused on independent uh, CITUS on a longitudinally polarized helium-3 target with these goals of extracting the PT dependence of the neutron uh, from the longitudinal spin structure and looking at nuclear corrections to CITUS, which I think really look at comparison of deuterium and helium-3. Just repeating, I think the proposed measurements are complementary and synergistic with other approved and planned experiments. And uh, once the target is realized, um, you know, there will be other scientific opportunities. So just to be clear, um, what we're requesting here is kind of the scientific endorsement of this uh, committee to allow us to proceed with the development of the target. Uh, if, we're, if you give, a, give us a favorable review, uh, we would go off and build a target, it's gonna take several years, and basically there would be really no scientific impact on the class 12 uh, program until we come back with a working target. So thank you. Thank you very much, Richard.
I call on the first reader of the proposal, and that is Matthias Bergkamp. Please, Matthias. Hi, Richard. This is Matthias. Hi, Matthias. Uh, th thanks for this very interesting uh, talk. I think it's a great idea to introduce uh, Helium-3 target in class 12 and uh, make good use of the experimental capabilities uh, there. I have uh, two or three questions on the target, uh, but I want to start with the physics question. Um, when you show the projections, you always show errors on the symmetries. Mm -hmm. And uh, to then do the physics analysis, uh, you know, other external information is needed, at least in some cases. For example, in the Coutinho and Mulder uh, sine to phi uh, AUL, um, I think one thing you're interested in is extracting H1 perp. Uh, may maybe not the experimental collaboration, the theories afterwards. Mm -hmm. But an input that's needed for this is the Collins function. Uh, in other mm -hmm. places, I think you need other unpolarized fragmentation functions. Mm -hmm. Have you checked if uh, the uh, accuracy of uh, that information uh, is sufficient so that one can make full use of uh, the statistical and systematic errors that will be achieved in, in your measurements? Yes, yeah, I, I know we've worked on let me Let me pass that to Harut, uh, if Harut is, is on. Uh, yeah, can, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. This uh, yeah projections for uh, the the Cotinian Mulders were uh, done by uh, uh, Peter Schweitzer and his collaborators, uh, uh, accounting for um, uh, errors on on the um, both. Basically, that's the Van Dura Vilcek uh, approximation for H1L and the uh, existing uh, Collins fragmentation function with its error. So we, within the, the statistical errors, we have also this um, lines and band on on uh, on those. I think it, 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 the, the picture is included in the in the proposal as well, with the with the band coming from variations of Collins function. So, oh, so uh, I, I see. So you include this error in your projections, and uh, yes, so it, can... it, it, it brings to the band. I mean, the the the, the yeah. curves uh, um, uh, Richard was showing were. Uh, Averages, but we in the proposal we also have with a band. Uh, so that that tells me then also if I want to go the other direction, uh, you know what the uncertainties are if I rely on the 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 fragmentation function, the experimental fragmentation function. Anything yes, I mean this you, this this observable has all the uncertainties coming from the transversity and from from Collins. Yeah. Yeah. So it it, it gives you quite some spread. It, it definitely. Uh, but the statistical uh, errors are, are are much smaller than the spread that we have currently. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And then uh, on the target, uh, so this is a very interesting uh, development, and I appreciate that at Ecole Normale Superior in Paris they have managed to uh, go to higher fields. I, I think this is in MRI magnets and uh, to higher pressures and. You have used targets at very high beam currents at uh, baits. But you describe uh, several ways how the uh, target could uh, depolarize. And uh, one I'm worried about is uh, basically the beam load. Um, you describe a mechanism how a helium-3 uh, 2 plus molecule mm -hmm. uh, is formed, and I think that basically unpolarizes, it takes away uh, two mm -hmm. polarized, potentially polarized helium-3 mm -hmm. uh, atoms. And uh, so I, I wonder, uh, now in the uh, JLab application, um, th there could be additional uh, mechanisms. Uh, so for example, the target cell is coated with hydrogen uh, to prevent uh, depolarization. Mm -hmm. um, and the beam might uh, evaporate uh, some of uh, this hydrogen. Uh, could there be other exotic molecules, uh, for example, helium-3 H+, um, that uh, would have similarly uh, depolarizing effects? Yeah, so, uh, no, I mean, it's, that, that's, I think, the principal issue in terms of the real, you know, realizing the target. I would say the following. We studied this extensively at Caltech uh, in the 80s with ion beams. We were the ones who just, you know, figured out that it was a diatomic molecule. And then the, the theory, atomic theorists, Happer and Walker and others, really put it on a, a very firm footing. And, um, the, 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 and so, you know, it, 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 
calculated at Bates, I think we had, the, you, can, you can determine the intrinsic beam depolarization by, so you, you, you have two cells, and you basically depolarize, you turn off the laser, depolarize the pumping cell with the 25 microamps of beam on, and then you watch the, the polarized atoms come from the target cell, and they're in diffusive contact, and so you know the time constants. And so the time constant at Bates was about 1,000 seconds. Uh, it was really long, at 25 microamps. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, we're going to be at higher pressure, which is worse. We're going to be at lower current, which is better. And we're going to, the main thing, the, the, the major uncertainty, you say, why didn't we calculate this? But the problem is that it, uh, is the high field. Uh, well, it's, it's actually an advantage. It should be an advantage because most depolarization mechanisms go via atomic processes. The, the nuclei at five Tesla will be pretty solid, but if you start depolarizing electrons, putting them in molecules, then they can, they can uh, depolarize. But at five Tesla, you break the hyperfine coupling. You're much higher than the critical field. So right. you, would, you would think that um, it should be, a lot, should be significantly better. And this is, you know, we've gone through this with the source at, at, at Brookhaven. But, you know, there, the, the atomic physics processes are not known at five Tesla. That's the problem. So we will actually, if we get to build a target and test it, we will actually do new atomic physics. And, and, and so, I mean, that is, these are all the facts I can give you. And, um, okay. you know. <laughs> so there's really quite a bit of experience. Did you look at Bates in the possibility that there could be a radial dependence of the target polarization since uh, this, uh, this exotic molecules are positively charged? So they will I mean, be to the beam. I mean, at the end of the day, all you care about are the, the polarized helium-3 that you scatter your electron from. And so, um, for example, at Bates, one of the first things we did was elastic scattering. So one of the first things we would do here is we would, we would like to do anyway is run at low energies. If you run at 10.6 GeV, you can't really do elastic scattering. If you run at 2 GeV, you could measure elastics, you know, the elastic scattering asymmetry, which is absolutely well known. And so you can verify that the, the electrons that scatter from your polarized nucleus, what exactly the polarization of those was. That's in the end really all you care about. Uh, but yeah, it's you know it's um, it's it is that's that's where we're at, and I think um, building so the part. Let sorry. me make sure I understood what you just said. I think you said you can use the inclusive scattering as a polarimeter, with which you then also could get radial dependencies and longitudinal dependencies. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that that's good. Um, because that I was going to ask, uh, there's no local polarimeter. I think according to the uh, proposal embedded in the in the target cell, but yeah, you, I mean, you, you can you can imagine doing NMR or something, but uh, it's it like you know, it's space is very confined. It's a metal cell, um, you know, it's 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 challenging. But it, the coupling of the two cell system actually worked quite well um, in furthering okay. the target polarization. Okay, thank you. Those were my questions. Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, Alessandro Baquetas, the second reader. Alessandro, do you have any questions? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Okay, great. So one, one pretty big question, which has to do also with other experiments, is the following. On top of asymmetries, it would be extremely important to measure polarization ever quantities, uh, cross-sectional multiplicities. It would be really a pity if JLab provided only asymmetries. And this holds true also for the helium-3 target, right? So would it be possible to incorporate in the analysis also amplified quantities? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think we, we iterated on email on this. I mean, um, the fact that the target, is, you have pure scattering from the gas, polarized gas uh, with, with, without dilution means that you can do that directly. If you want, you know, if you say you want a cross section, that's a, you know that's a whole other uh, level of difficulty. But if you want to spin average multiplicities, um, to be relatively straightforward. I mean, I would be already satisfied with the multiplicities, but my fear is that since your your uh, emphasis is on the polarized target, then you you invest most of the uh, of the attention on the asymmetries, and maybe you uh, neglect uh, the the unpolarized uh, quantities, uh, which actually should be should be known and understood even before the asymmetries. 
Alessandro, um, you know, I was responsible for the polarized helium-3 target at Hermes, and in, that was how we got into unpolarized tar uh, gases, because we could, put, could change from helium-3 gas to nitrogen to argon xenon. Hermes measured all of these uh, multiplicities on nuclei with this type of target. So we, we just didn't focus it on in terms of a physics motivation, but technically, you know, you can do this. This is just a this is just a cold metal cell. I mean, you can put helium three gas. You could put any any of these uh, nuclear gases in as well if you wish into this target system. Yeah, and then that's great. I mean, you you should pay attention also to this side for sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm glad that we agree. And uh, um, then I have a couple of other questions, Marcus, if I can. Um, try and keep it brief if you can. One is, uh, what are the challenges to achieve transpolarization? Which extent are they similar or different for from hydrogen and UTA? James, do you want to speak to this? <laughs> yes, hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, so uh, transverse polarization, while we don't really um, focus on it in, in this particular proposal, um, obviously, it's uh, sort of supremely interesting. And so um, what, we've, what we've looked at is the work that's been done by the HD ICE group. And, and they actually, there are, I think, three um, conditionally approved proposals to measure transverse uh, HD ICE. Uh, and, and their technique is to use a bulk magnesium diboride uh, su superconducting material, sort of cancel out the longitudinal field and create a, a smaller transverse holding field. And, and so based on the work that, that they've does, done, we'd like to sort of incorporate that work uh, and, and sort of try a similar thing uh, with this this uh, polarized helium-3 target. So we have sort of two concepts that we're looking at, one where we polarize in the high field, the 5 Tesla uh, longitudinal solenoid and transfer into a transversely uh, polarized, uh, transversely aligned field inside the shield. A second would be to actually put both the pumping cell and the target cell inside this uh, transverse holding field within the shield. But, um, you know, as, as I mentioned, HCIS has a um, few conditionally approved experiments to, to use this, uh, and there's still a good deal of work that needs to go into investigating how well uh, these uh, bulk superconducting materials will work. Um, but th that's sort of the what we'd look like to look at. So once we understand the longitudinally polarized target uh, well, this is what we would move to next. Okay, so you, your contribution could be of of help also to HDIs then. Absolutely, yeah. No, we'd definitely be interested in in uh, looking at these and, and helping HDIs with uh, the transverse uh, gathering program. Um, Very last quick, quick question. You are, you are uh, yes. Just 30 days for uh, proton and, and uh, deuterium class asked something like 100 days. So, are the 100 days too many or are the 30 days too few? Uh, do you see my slide, ND3 versus helium 3 comparison? Yeah. So, this is a comparison of what we propose in red on helium 3 with what's approved on, on deuterium. Yeah, so, so why, why in 30 days you can have uh, uh, even better uh, statistics than the, than the blue one? <laughs> well, you know, um, th this is what we think we can do. So, uh, you know, I can't talk about ND3, but I can tell you what we think we can do with helium-3. I mean, if you look at the, at the DIS experiments over decades, starting in Slack and also at JLab, I mean, the, the, the helium-3 is statistically is generally surpassed the uh, the dynamic okay. nuclear polarized targets. I think it's a dilution factor, right? Uh, yeah, that's part, exactly, that's part of it. Right. Yeah. 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 Can I add something? This is Rolf. Uh, of course, Please do. The, the, the dynamically nuclear polarized targets, Alessandro, also have a current limitation for depolarization. I believe it's most, mostly run at less than 100 nanoamps. I believe. Uh, Yes, I think they run with 100 nanoam for ND3, and we have a much higher the um, dilution factor above like one in the PT. So that's why ND3 will get really uh, big the statistic error bar with the high PT. Yes. 
Okay, okay. I think Thank that you. is then uh, clarified. Thank you, everyone. Um, I uh, suggest we move on and have the next presentation on uh, polarization transfer in wide angle uh, pion production that is uh, presented by Andrew Puckett. Please, Andrew. Uh, thank you. Can everybody hear me? I'm turning on my video at least for the first few minutes. If it creates any bandwidth issues, I'll turn it off. Um, just you you well. uh, since not everyone knows uh, me and I don't know everyone. All right, so I'm going to start my screen sharing and uh, let's do this. Okay, can you see my presentation? Full screen, everything is fine, you're set. Okay, great. So let me know if I need to turn off my video. Um, yeah, I don't know what kind of upload speed I have on my home connection here. Okay, so f first of all, I wanna start by thanking um, all of the PAC members uh, for your time and effort in performing this valuable service to the lab and the, and the Hedron physics community. Um, and for the opportunity to uh, present this proposal on polarization transfer in charge pion photo production. Um, right, so just by way of uh, introduction, uh, the spokespeople of this proposal are, are John Arrington from Argonne, uh, myself from Yukon, uh, and Arun uh, Tadapali and Bogdan Wojciechowski from Jefferson Lab. And um, these are the spokespeople, and in, in addition, uh, the number of collaborators who signed on to our proposal is about 60, uh, representing about 20 different institutions. Okay, so um, by way of introduction, um, <clears throat> the photo production of, of uh, the real photo production of pseudoscalar mesons um, is a field that has a, a rich and long history. Um, and this is in, on some level, arguably the simplest inelastic hadronic process that you can imagine. Um, we're producing the lightest meson uh, from the lightest baryon uh, with uh, using the energy and momentum from a real photon. And the cross sections for this process have been fairly extensively studied uh, at low energies from threshold uh, up to and including the nucleon resonance region. Um, but you know, at, at Jefferson Lab, a uh, big goal of our scientific program is, is to understand the nucleon's uh, partonic structure, and, and uh, it plays an important role in this particular reaction. And uh, to access the partonic structure, you need to go to high energy. And the data uh, at high energies for this process are fairly limited, right? So we have um, uh, measurements from SLAC in the 1970s, um, and we have measurements from Hall A um, in the early 2000s, and, and we also have uh, more recent data from the class collaboration um, that that are in the high energy regime. So the an interesting phenomenon and possibly contradiction is that at a fixed center of mass angle, um, the cross section scales uh, approximately as s to the minus seven. Uh, which appears consistent with uh, constituent counting rules based on perturbative QCD. Um, on the other hand, for hard exclusive reactions, we have a lot of other evidence um, that implies that perturbative QCD probably not applicable to hard exclusive reactions until much higher energies uh, than we currently have measured. Um, so <clears throat> I, I would argue that at, and I want to point out here that this curve shown in the center of mass angle dependence plot here is is just a fit uh, to the data. It's not any uh, you know theor theoretical calculation. But I would argue that um, even after about five decades of of uh, effort and experiment and theory, we don't uh, clearly understand the underlying reaction mechanism for this process. And uh, knowledge of the cross sections is a necessary but not sufficient condition for uh, you know, true understanding of the reaction mechanism. Okay, so um, the theoretical motivation for this proposal focuses on uh, the framework of generalized parton distributions, um, and and we seek to understand this process in terms of of the handbag mechanism. And um, as as most of you are are well familiar with, um, the the basic 
idea here is that the scattering amplitude factorizes um, into uh, a hard partonic subprocess um, and the overlap of soft wave functions um, that are parameterized by universal functions known as the GPDs. And uh, you only have one active parton, or the reaction mechanism here is that you only have one active parton from both the initial and the final nucleon, right? So, um, you know, if you want to interpret this in terms of a leading twist partonic picture, um, the, the leading diagrams are shown here. I don't know if you can see my pointer, um, but these are basically the one hard gluon exchange diagrams where the real or virtual photon interacts with uh, a single cork in the target, right? And the meson is produced by hard gluon exchange. Um, so as I'll get, as I'll show in more detail on the next slide, um, these leading twist calculations um, badly underpredict uh, the observed cross sections in the high energy regime where we think this framework is applicable, right? It, basically, uh, the condition is that all the Mandelstam variables be, be in some sense large, uh, sufficiently large compared to lambda QCD uh, or a typical uh, hadronic mass scale. Um, the good news, however, right, is that it's, is that uh, recently um, the the theorists have uh, gotten more advanced in their efforts and and been able to calculate the full twist three amplitude um, that also includes these three particle thought components of the meson uh, in in the analysis and uh, the twist three calculations can explain the large cross sections uh, that have been measured in the high energy regime um, so. You know that that is a strong hint that that twist three is dominant in this process, and then uh, you can you can actually test this prediction unambiguously using polarization observables, which is the subject of this proposal. Right. So I should also note, uh, according to this paper, uh, that the leading twist calculations have also uh, done a fairly poor job at, in describing uh, deeply virtual meson production. Uh, and specifically exclusive electroproduction of pions. Um, okay, so um, to get more specific and show some data, um, these are the neutral pion photoproduction data from the class collaboration, uh, only a couple of years old. And this blue solid curve here represents uh, the prediction of leading twist handbag uh, calculations. Um, and you can see, right, that the prediction falls short of the data, you know, by by two to three orders of magnitude uh, over its expected rain, range of applicability. Um, so, <clears throat> so the good news again, right, is that um, the the full twist three calculation um, is able to explain uh, the the cross sections rather well, right? These three curves here are are calculations as a function of uh, center of mass angle at different uh, values of S, right? And this black curve is the S value of the actual data here, okay? So the conclusion uh, based on the calculations and the cross sections is that, um, you know, these three particle twist three diagrams um, are not just important, but in fact dominant, All right? Uh, another, another process that has, uh, proven quite valuable in terms of uh, understanding uh, GPDs is real Compton scattering. And, um, you know, here you have a simpler, uh, it's theoretically much simpler because you don't have an extra hadron in the final state. Um, and, and what you find, right, is that uh, the cross sections measured in the high energy regime are actually in reasonable agreement with the leading twist predictions. Um, the polarization observables have also been measured for this process, both in Hall A, which is this black point, and Hall C. Um, and it's a, and the key thing here is the power of polarization observables um, in discriminating among theoretical models. And and uh, this Hall A result uh, was consistent with GPD-based predictions that were available uh, prior to the publication of this measurement. Right, so so it seemed that uh, the GPD approach was was very much on the right track. Um, on the other hand, this this more recent result from Hall C uh, was not consistent with any calculation that was available at the time. Um, but 
you know, as pointed out by Peter Kroll uh, a few years ago, um, this this data point pr has proven extremely useful. Um, in so you turn it around um, and use this data to constrain the GPD modeling, um, and it turns out you can you can uh, learn a fair bit. Excuse me, you can learn a fair bit about this uh, poorly known axial GPD H tilde uh, from the KLL measurement for real Compton scattering. Um, and there's there's actually an approved program in Hall C um, to look at the polarized target observables in this process. Um, okay, so if you returning to Pion photo production, um, these these twist three calculations uh, in the handbag approach, uh, which which suggest twist three dominance uh, in in this process uh, based on cross section comparisons. Um, also make predictions for all the all the relevant spin observables that you can measure in this process, and and these are the predictions for uh, charge pion photo production and and neutral pion production on the proton, and and these observables I should emphasize have never been measured before for charge pions in the wide angle regime, right? And an important um, and a, an important result of these calculations, right, is that if twist two is dominant, right, then then the Polarized target asymmetry uh, and the polarization transfer uh, should be essentially the same, right? Have the same sign and magnitude. On the other hand, if twist three contribution is dominant, um, then these observables have uh, large equal magnitude and opposite sign, right? So that's that's the prediction. Uh, this proposal and a future proposal on a polarized target are setting out to test. All right. So again, uh, if you go back to the long range plan uh, from uh, five years ago, <clears throat> the 3D imaging of the nucleon structure via GPDs is a major motivation for both the JLab 12 GB science program and the planned EIC. Um, and, you know, the, the elephant in the room uh, of the failure of, of uh, this approach for wide angle uh, pion photo production uh, in a regime where we expect applicability of the handbag formalism, um, you know, is is something that's important to to understand, right? Uh, to understand the reaction mechanism of this process. Um, so, you know, if we if we compare these calculations, twist two and twist three, to the cross section data, then the prediction for the spin observables are fairly unambiguous, right? And and easily testable. So. The goal of our proposal is, is to provide a first measurement of the recoil polarization observables um, in the high energy wide angle regime. Um, and if this proposal is approved, um, the measurement would be coupled with a future measurement on polarized helium three. Right. And, um, you know, whether whether we confirm or, or falsify the, the twist three handbag calculations, um, these observables will uh, definitely provide important constraints for GPD modeling. Um, and finally, I just want to emphasize that this measurement is, is inexpensive, uh, and it's, it's sort of a one-time opportunity, and it's timely, um, uh, uh, and it would provide useful, valuable information that, depending on the results and their interpretation, how interesting they are, uh, could lead to a wider program uh, of polarization measurements in this reaction. All right, so uh, the basic, now, now let's discuss the experiment. Um, basically, we're looking to piggyback on this GEN recoil polarization experiment that was approved by PAC-45 um, to measure the neutron form factor ratio. And, and uh, the interesting, or one interesting thing about this experiment is that it'll be the first use of the charge exchange uh, polarimetry for neutrons in a form factor measurement. Um, you can also use this setup uh, to measure uh, the photo production, the pion photo production observables, recoil polarization observables um, in identical kinematics. All right. So this experiment is likely to run next year, um, and so uh, approval of of this add-on by this pack is a one-time opportunity uh, to achieve these measurements that would otherwise be quite difficult and require either new significant new beam time and or significant new resources. So these are the key differences between uh, our proposal and the GEN recoil experiment. Uh, we run at third pass instead of second pass. 
Uh, we run at a somewhat lower current. Um, we put a radiator upstream of the deuterium target to um, increase the real photon flux target. Um, and we also need to modify the trigger logic of Big Byte using existing electronics uh, to enhance its sensitivity to charge pions and suppress high energy electrons and photons. Okay, so uh, schematically, right, this is what um, a pion, uh, a charge pion photo production event looks like in the experiment. So the pions are detected in Big Byte, um, and you have gem based tracking. Um, you have a gas Cherenkov, which is not sensitive to pions at the moment of this proposal. And then you have the, the pre-shower and shower calorimeters. And of course, the tendency uh, with pions is that they don't deposit much energy in the pre-shower, but they deposit a fair amount of energy in the, in the shower. On the hadron, on the nucleon side, we have SBS uh, as both spectrometer and polarimeter for the outgoing polarized protons. Um, and basically you have uh, gem-based tracking uh, before and after a secondary analyzing scattering in, in a steel analyzer. Okay. You have five minutes left? Five minutes? Okay, that should be enough. Okay, so um, with 6.6 .6 GeV at the kinematics of GeN recoil, um, these are the distributions of the Mandelstam variables. And so you see that, that and it's important to note that this is for a minimum photon energy cut of 4 GeV, right? So um, these are the average values and the key point uh, or the key uh, aspect of this proposal is that the Mandelstam variables are all sufficiently large um, that we expect applicability of, of the GPD handbag approach. Um, okay, so a few words about polarimetry. Um, for those of you who aren't uh, steeped in this technique, um, basically, uh, you have measurement of the proton trajectory both before and after this analyzing scattering, um, and the spin-orbit coupling uh, in the proton nucleus interaction generates an azimuthal uh, asymmetry um, that's proportional to the transverse uh, polarization of the incoming proton. Um, so, if the proton starts out longitudinally polarized, um, the the dipole magnet that plays the role, the dual role of uh, spectrometer for momentum analysis uh, also processes uh, the spin of the protons uh, into a, the longitudinal component into a transverse component that can be measured. Um, so these are all the ingredients of the of the estimated figure of merit of the proposal. Uh, basically, it's it's the uh, this this figure of merit that's shown in this table here. Uh, is is defined as the ratio of the sum of the squared asymmetry magnitude um, divided by the number of incident protons, and um, this is this is how the the figure of merit defined this way um, relates to the statistical precision on on the KLL. All right. um, so you can see that if we assume a KLL around 0.8, as suggested by the predictions, um, in two days just two days of beam, right? We can get a 5% relative precision there. Um, and the ingredients here uh, are a par parameterization of the analyzing power uh, from the GEP3 experiment, uh, which covers the momentum range of this proposal. Um, and we simulate the scattering efficiency in J on four uh, using the simulation that you see a screenshot from right here. Okay, so uh, to summarize, uh, our beam request, uh, our total, our total uh, request consists of three days, right? And these are the, this is the breakdown of those three days. Um, so we need, we assume eight hours for an increase in the beam energy, um, and in parallel we accomplish the changeover of the trigger configuration uh, following the GENRP experiment. Um, it, you know, as suggested by the technical report on this proposal. Um, we, we increase our request by eight hours, um, you know, just to include uh, sufficient time for commissioning of the big byte pion trigger with beam, right? Most of that can be accomplished during the initial commissioning of big byte, um, but after the configuration change, we want to verify that it's working. So two days of production and then uh, an energy change uh, back to 4.4 
from 6.6 GeV, but I should note that this second energy change can proceed in parallel uh, with the removal of the polarimeter uh, because, because after that you would be starting the changeover to GMN, right? So this second energy change doesn't actually add to the total runtime of, of the GMN run group. And finally, um, because you measure both transverse components of the polarization simultaneously uh, in this measurement, you, you also get uh, the KLS uh, with comparable precision, right? And, um, you know, this, this thing is designed to be a polarimeter for neutrons as well. Um, so it's likely that we'll also be able to obtain a publishable result for uh, the pi plus neutron channel, uh, albeit less precise because uh, this neutron in the final state um, is is more difficult to reconstruct. Okay, so to summarize, uh, polarization observables have never been measured before uh, for the charged pion photoproduction uh, in the wide angle regime where the handbag me mechanism should be applicable. Um, if you believe the cross-section calculations um, and in comparison to data, um, the strong implication is that the twist three amplitudes aren't merely important, but dominant in this process. And under this assumption, you get unambiguous and easily testable predictions uh, for the polarization observables. Uh, the SPS program is likely to start next year, um, and GEN recoil gives us a one-time opportunity uh, to achieve these measurements very inexpensively. Um, and following GMN and GENRP, the uh, polarized helium-3 target program uh, will present another one-time opportunity uh, to get the, the beam target asymmetries and sim similar kinematics with a comparably small beam request, right? And so if this proposal is approved, uh, a companion proposal would be submitted to the next pack. Um, and, and finally, uh, the reason that SBS and Big Byte are optimal for, for this kind of process uh, is its medium, solid angle, large momentum byte, and high luminosity capability um, that makes it ideal for uh, two-particle coincidence reactions and hard exclusive and also semi-inclusive processes. Right. So uh, to summarize, a timely and an inexpensive first look will give us valuable information, and it could motivate a larger and more systematic program depending on the results. All right, so thank you, uh, and I hope I didn't go over time uh, by much, if at all. By one minute. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the uh, questions will be started by Alessandro Bacchetta, who is the first reader. Please, Alessandro. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Andrew, for the presentation. I also show my face so we can see each other while. Now, in the presentation, you make this statement that you can uh, provide an unambiguous test of twist three and calculations and important constraints for GPD modeling. Now, I'm skeptical about the possibility that you can really achieve, for sure, both goals simultaneously and maybe either one of them. And, and to discuss more, uh, um, uh, to have a clearer discussion, if you take your slide 13, where you have your data point compared to the predictions. Oh, am I still sharing? Yeah. Well, you're sharing, but yes, you're not in full screen, but you're still sharing. So in slide 13. Yeah, I'm on uh, slide 13. The one with the number. Full screen. I don't know if you can see that. Okay. Full screen. Yeah, this one, this one, this one is okay. Yeah, that's, one, that's the one. Now, the point is, if the theory prediction is really very, uh, with a very narrow band, then you can test the approach, but it means that you don't provide constraint on the GPDs. Vice versa, if the theory prediction were very with a very large band, then you can provide a constraint on the GPDs, but you have to assume the validity of the model. You see right. uh, point. So you, you cannot do both things. And this depends a bit on the bands on the error bands of the theory approach which are not uh, there so this is a word of caution or skepticism on my side okay your point is well taken um and it's a valid point um that that indeed 
um, without without some kind of uh, realistic estimate of the uncertainty on these predictions um, that that it's it's sort of either or in terms of the goals right if if the if the theoretical predictions uh, have small uncertainties um, then they can be tested robustly um, but on the other hand if the predictions have large uncertainties um, then then this measurement would still provide important constraints uh, to on the ingredients that go into these calculations that that uh, involve the GPDs, right? And I mean, as, yeah, assuming the validity of the of the model, right? I mean, on some level, right? This entire GPD program at at Jefferson Lab and and future EIC, right, de depends on on the assumption of the validity of this of this GPD framework. Right. So the important thing, you know, the important thing is that we do this measurement uh, with reasonable precision uh, at, at high enough energy. Right. And a large enough uh, center of mass angle uh, where where we where these predict or where this framework ought to be applicable. So I, I, I'm not really qualified to. Um, comment on what are the realistic uncertainties of these predictions, um, but I, I think for such an inexpensive measurement, um, we'll, undoubtedly, uh, we'll undoubtedly learn something. I, I, I don't know if that, I don't know if that uh, alleviates your skepticism, um, but I think, I think that's the best argument I can make um, at this point. Okay, right. thank you. I'm, I'm okay, Marcus. Uh, no other questions. Thank you very much. Then uh, I pass the word to Steve Dijkman, who is the second reader of the proposal. Steve, any questions? Uh, yeah, I'll try one question. Uh, you have a single angle and a single set of STU variables in two days of beam time. Yes, it's it's inexpensive. But do you feel this is a sufficient test? Right. Well, that without doing the measurement, it's it's difficult to say. But but um, but I I do, you know, I I do believe this. I mean, I mean, if these, I I don't know if uh, we have Peter on the line. Uh, probably not. But um, yeah, I I do I do feel. Um, you know that if you if we do uh, both of these measurements, right, um, KLL and ALL, right, that that's not uh, in the scope of this proposal, um, but could be accomplished uh, in similarly small beam time. Um, yeah, I think I think that would be quite powerful, and I think I think that would be uh, sufficient uh, to get us at least a first indication. Uh, of whether of whether this approach is is working right, and whether the polarization observables right are consistent with the expectations, um, you know, un, under the assumption of twist three dominance, right? And um, if if the results if the results are uh, significantly de deviant from these predictions um, at, or ambiguous. Um, then, then in principle, uh, you could motivate a more systematic program uh, that would, of course, require more beam time. Um, but, but the idea here is this is a one-time opportunity to learn something, right? Without without a, a huge investment uh, in beam time. Okay, thanks. Is there any other urgent question from a member of the PAC? That doesn't seem to be the case. Then let's thank the speaker and turn to the next presentation, the last one of uh, this session. This will be given by Marie Boer, and it's sharing. about timed Compton scattering. We cannot presently hear you, Marie. We see you, but we don't hear you. At least I don't hear you. I don't hear her either. Could you try and give her some advice? 
We were working great earlier. Seems to be a hobby of the Blue Jane software. Marie, we still don't hear you. No. <clears throat> Maybe she should drop out and reconnect. That's yeah, exactly. Idea. Let's drop out and reconnect. That is the right. best way to solve this. Marie, I'm going to boot you out. All right, I see her back on. Yeah, can you hear me? We hear you perfect. Okay, great. Uh, so, so, yeah, so I will share my screen. And now you should be able to see my slides. Yes. Yes, perfect. You are set to go. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, so I will talk about uh, time-lapse content scattering of uh, transversely polarized proton. And uh, so this work is in collaboration with the Sinclair, Vardante, Devocian, and many other people. And it is a proposal for HOLC, which is associated with NPS and CPS collaborations. Um, so we are actually coming back after our conditionally uh, C2 approved proposal in 2018. And the main tech concern we had back in the time were uh, high rates in the rhodoscopes and uh, proton tracking accuracy. So we work on these uh, two issues. And our main updates that I'm presenting today are that we replaced rhodoscope by GEM uh, and Synthiator rhodoscope for the proton detection and tracking. Uh, we also included GEM, Synthiator's, uh, and Carimeter uh, together for the trigger, and we improved our background and tracking studies. I will first discuss what is new uh, in our setup, and then I will summarize the other part of the proposal, so uh, like other part of the setup and the goals of our experiment. <clears throat> so here we have a cartoon of, um, of the spectrometer, so it is a dedicated uh, um, setup that we would like to have, and the, the reaction we are measuring is photon-proton uh, going to uh, electron positron and, uh, and proton. So we would like to detect the three particle coincidence and have also the three of them in the trigger. Um, so we would like to have 11 GV uh, electron beam at 2.5 microam from SEBAF. So it is going uh, to the compact photon source, which is a radiator where electron is dumped in magnet, and have a secondary uh, photon beam uh, here uh, going from 5.5 to 11 GV. Um, with an um, intensity of uh, 1.5 10 to the 12 uh, photon per second. So it is going to a transverse polarized target here. And we can see the three particles, so proton, electron, uh, and uh, positron. Uh, so going to uh, this uh, uh, spectrometer part, constituted by uh, three layers of gem, uh, scintillators, rhodoscopes here in green, and um, the pair of lepton is, uh, will be detected in a, a length of state perimeter uh, as shown here. So all the projections we have are assuming 30 pack days uh, for the physics, and uh, at our photon intensity it corresponds to 5.8 uh, 10 to the 5 inverse by Coburn. <clears throat> so here is uh, just another view uh, of uh, the spectrometer. Uh, so we can see the photon beam coming here to the target scattering chamber. And what I wanted to show with this uh, uh, picture is that uh, we actually divided in a four symmetric quadrant. 
uh, the, uh, the spectrometer part. Uh, so we come back later for the reasons. So we can see here uh, we are three layers of gem. Uh, here, this is uh, the uh, scintillator photoscopes, and behind we have the calorimeters. <coughs> so for um, for the tracking, so we, uh, as I mentioned, we included uh, gem now. So we intend to use uh, gem which are similar as the one from the uh, super big bite experiment. Uh, so we have a picture on the top left of a prototype, so that was uh, uh, tested and um, and will be used for for SBS. And uh, here we also have a scan of um, um, of functioning of the of the gem module. So we have uh, four groups. Uh, so as uh, shown here in uh, my previous slide, also uh, and three layers of uh, of gem. Um, so why we decided to use GEM is that because they have a high tolerance rate um, and they can go up to 10 to the 6 hertz per millimeter square, so which is about 10 times higher uh, than the rate that we expect to have. Uh, so they are shown uh, here on the left uh, for the second layer of uh, GEM. Um, GEM also have a, high, uh, a good uh, tracking accuracy with about uh, 100 micrometer resolution. And they have a tolerance to magnetic field, which is much higher than what we want. So it was uh, as tested with bonus 1.5 Tesla. Um, so and there are several other experiments, uh, in particular in Hall A, using this type of, of gem, so SBS, Pirad, and uh, Solid. So other um, modification to our setup. So now we have uh, the scintillator odoscopes behind the, the gem, so in green here, and we can see them here. Um, so the, the area which is covered by the scintillator photoscope will be matching uh, with the area covered by GEM and uh, behind by the calorimeters. Uh, so we have we have active elements of two, two times two times five centimeter cube uh, with light detector in the rear, and they, they are placed along the particle trajectory. So the, the goal of uh, including uh, scintillator rhodoscopes will be uh, both to complement our trigger, but also to improve our tracking resolution. And uh, in particular, as we can see uh, on this picture here, which is uh, the DE over DX uh, for different particles, we can see that we have a pretty good uh, pi and proton separation from 0.1 to 1 GeV. And uh, so that's where all our protons are. And actually, most of our protons are between 0.2 and 0.3 uh, GeV in momentum, so which means that we are absolutely able to separate uh, proton and, and pions. So I'm not here. I will um, uh, come back later. But all the particle, so our um, analysis magnet is also the target uh, magnetic field. So we don't have specific uh, other magnet uh, than the one from the from the target. So now, uh, how? Uh, we intend to, to have our trigger and DAC system, uh, so which is also one of the main modifications since uh, 2018. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, we intend to have the three particles in, uh, in the trigger, three final particles, and we have two levels of trigger. So I'm showing on the on the left uh, here um, a scheme of the of the DAC system. Um, and I would just comment on the different level of trigger. So we have uh, at level one, we request uh, to have um, to take the, tr the two strongest cluster in the calorimeter and apply some quite high uh, energy cuts. So we request to have, uh, like for each of the cluster, a deposit uh, energy above 1 GeV. And for the combined energy, we request to have uh, above 5 GeV. So it is going to cut most of the low energy particle and backgrounds of the experiment. And it is corresponding to the, also to the physics regions that we are probing, so it is not um, almost not rejecting any of good events to have such high, uh, uh, high uh, threshold. So to complement these uh, two clusters in the calorimeter, we also request to have a deposition of, of energy in, uh, in the rhodoscopes, so matching uh, in, uh, for the time and for the track with the calorimeter clusters. So our level two trigger will also include, include uh, information from the from the gem, so we also request to have two uh, clusters in the calorimeters uh, with the same threshold in energy, uh, having also heat uh, in the scintillators in correlation uh, as well in time and uh, and for the track, and we also request to have uh, two uh, out of three 
uh, of the gem uh, having a uh, matching heat. So now uh, I will briefly uh, show the other part that we didn't modify from the, from the setup. Uh, so here it is a compact photon source, uh, which is a radiator which is going to provide us our uh, real photon beam. Uh, so it is still in development, but uh, it will be used uh, in the near future by uh, other approved experiments, such as uh, the WAX experiment. So it is a 10% copper radiator. Uh, it is as well used as a beam dump uh, for the experiment, so thanks to a 3.2 Tesla uh, magnet. <clears throat> so um, uh, we don't expect to have uh, any interference between the compact photon source and the target magnet. Uh, so from estimations, the uh, flame field uh, is uh, quite negligible. And um, so the um, secondary photon beam that we obtain will be of the order of uh, 1.5 10 to the 12 photon per second for uh, incoming electron beam of uh, 2.5 microamp. And uh, it's select range between 5.5 to, to 11 GV. Uh, so at two meter at the level of the of the gem, uh, we have about a one millimeter spot uh, for this photon beam. <clears throat> so now here I am showing uh, the transpolar target. Um, uh, so this, on this scheme here, we can see here uh, the target material which is insert, insert in the in this cell. So it will uh, be uh, ammonia, transversely polarized ammonia in a helium bath uh, for about a 0.6 uh, packing fraction. So the polarization technique for this target, uh, we use uh, dynamic nuclear polarization at 140 uh, gigahertz and also use uh, RF field of 20 watts. So the target magnet uh, is shown here. We, we see the two coils, so it's a Helmost, uh, Hel Helmholtz coil um, uh, providing a five Tesla uh, magnetic field. And as I mentioned earlier, so this magnetic field is also used to, to bend the, the particle uh, for the, the spectrometer. So polarization is uh, monitored in, uh, in life by uh, NMR technique. And um, so actually compared to this picture, the target uh, scattering chamber is rotated by 90 degrees uh, in order to provide uh, the transverse polarization. So this is what is limiting uh, our acceptance, uh, so as shown here, so 6 to 22 degrees. Uh, so due to the um, size of the, of the coils. So to avoid radiation damage, so as shown here on this uh, little scan, so the, tar the cell will be rotating and also have a up-down motion. So uh, leading to the beam have this uh, little spiral. Um, position uh, along the, the experiment. So this will avoid depolarization effects and also uh, having much less radiation damage. So limit the number of times that uh, the cell need to recover. So it's used actually by several other experiments uh, uh, at 6 GB in the past and 12 GB. Uh, so performance are uh, pretty well known. Um, and yeah. So now the last part of the spectrometer are the colorometers. So we can see them here in blue. And uh, so they are developed by the uh, NPS, Neutral Particle Spectrometer Collaboration. So we can see here uh, uh, several crystals uh, of the length of state of, of this uh, calorimeter. And so about uh, half of the crystal will be used by other approved experiments, such as uh, DVCS, for instance. And there are uh, many studies, so it will uh, run very soon. And there are uh, many studies that are already done and will be done uh, pre or uh, the, the time that we could maybe uh, have our experiment. Uh, so as for the other part of the spectrometer, so we divided the calorimeter in four uh, quadrants. Uh, so four groups that we can see here. And uh, so the uh, horizontal gap is motivated by the target acceptance, while the vertical gap is motivated to avoid a region where we would have um, really uh, high rates. So the motivation is uh, at the same time to avoid uh, such high rates from low energy particles which are going to this direction due to the target magnetic field, and also to, to avoid, uh, of course, damage 
uh, to the to the spectral matter in uh, in this uh, region. So it's not rejecting uh, any good physics anyway because it's beta hacker dominated region. <coughs> So uh, we we'll use about uh, 2,000 blocks, and they, are, they will be assembled in 23 by 23 matrix. So the active area is actually matching the area of the gem and the rotoscopes. So the readout will be uh, ensured by uh, Hamamatsu uh, PM keys uh, using uh, three, three the diameter and the LKD photocathodes. So the radiation length is about uh, 22.5. Uh, so, which is enough to stop our high energy uh, electron positron. And the resolution will be, uh, um, is expected to be 2.5 per square root of E plus 1%, so about 2% for a sigma, sigma X, about 3, mid, 3 millimeters for 1 GV particles. So, calibration, uh, we intend to use a method that were used previously, uh, in particular for the same experiment in OIC. Uh, having uh, in situ calibration using by zero electro production. And we also expect to um, greatly um, uh, have a lot of information from uh, past experiments. So some tests uh, have already been done in uh, OLD. And, um, and since there will be in particular the DVCS experiment using the same uh, calorimeter, um, so we, we learn uh, a lot. So we'll allow to develop the method prior. Yes. So now I will briefly summarize our, uh, the physics goal of this experiment and also uh, discuss a little bit what we expect to, to get out of it. So we are measuring the reaction photon-proton give electron, positron, and uh, proton. And so for high energy and high virtuality uh, photon exchange, uh, so this includes uh, interference between time-lapse quantum scattering on the left and beta hacker on the right. You have uh, five so for... minutes left. Okay. So for time-lapse quantum scattering, uh, so we have a real photon, which is scattered of a quark of the nucleon, and it is followed by the emission of a high virtuality uh, photons, which decays into E plus E minus pair, as shown here. And so for uh, high virtuality photons, so this uh, reaction can be parameterized by generalized pattern distributions, so which depend on three uh, variables at uh, leading order, which are uh, x, uh, the longitudinal momentum fraction of the quark, psi, which is a schoolness variable, also is a, a fraction of a, a longitudinal momentum transfer, and T, which is a managed time T, uh, the transfer to the, to the uh, momentum transfer to the proton, so which is also providing us this, uh, de um, uh, by Fourier transform this uh, transverse position dependency of the, uh, that the GPD can, uh, can access. So the beta hacker process is not sensitive to uh, uh, GPDs, but is sensitive to form factors. And it corresponds to the splitting of a real photon into a nucleon pair, uh, into a lepton pair in the nucleon field. So now, uh, why do we want to measure time-lapse quantum scattering of a transversally polarized proton? So first, the main goal of our experiment is that it will provide a unique access to the GPDE uh, of the proton. So there are no uh, other experiments uh, currently accessing that in uh, the, the balance region at Jefferson Lab. Uh, so, second goal of this experiment is that it will nicely complement universality studies that can be done in uh, other, uh, by comparing uh, so other experiments, so combination of uh, different experiments measuring uh, DVCS and TCS observables. Uh, so, thanks to the fact that uh, leading order uh, TCS and DVCS are complex conjugates, so we are accessing the, the uh, same uh, information in terms of GPDs. And therefore, comparison of DVCS and TCS uh, are golden shadow to study universalities of the GP. Um, so measuring also two transverse polarization observables will also nicely complement the information available for GPD datasets in a balanced region. So here is a projections of the observables that we would like to measure. So this is a transverse spin asymmetry. Uh, presented as a function of phi, which is the azimutal angle between the <coughs> lepton scattering plane and the reaction plane. So the different curves are corresponding to different parameterizations. 
So uh, caveat is that I'm uh, only showing uh, projections using the VDG model. And our project projections, so given the lack of knowledge of GPDE in particular, can slightly differ uh, if we were using a different model. So different color of curve also correspond to different kind of parameterization of the GPDE uh, using different strengths for the uh, quark angular momenta GU and GD. So it is really emphasizing that uh, this observable is strongly dependent on the GPD uh, parameterization, and it is also strongly uh, sensitive to the quark angular momenta. So it is, <coughs> we can see in particular on the right, so it is the projections uh, as a function of phi s of the maximum asymmetry. And we can see that uh, here we have like a 0.2 difference of the size of the, of the asymmetry if we just vary the strength of G U and G D. And as I mentioned, this is only within the VGG framework. So we really need to have experimental data and uh, any point in this uh, curve um, will uh, greatly constrain, uh, help to constrain GPD models. <clears throat> uh, so I will uh, briefly flash uh, these slides. So these are, this is an exercise to, to show what will be new thanks to the transverse polarization. Um, so if we had DVCS uh, as in whole A, B, and C, um, um, and polarized and beam polarized cross sections, so we are able to extract uh, GPDE. So uh, thanks to the imaginary part of uh, the content form factor H and real part of, uh, of H. Uh, as shown here, if we had an equivalent uh, experiment uh, for TCS, uh, so we need to be uh, with higher statistics than uh, already accessible experiments, so we'll be also able to extract something at the same level, so which is why I say we can really uh, study University of, of GPD by comparison, so since in same condition we could be able to uh, get them at the same level. But what is new here is what I surrounded in uh, red, is that we are now sensitive to the GPD which is really our main goal uh, and it is unique because it is not measured in a, by other experiments. <coughs> um, so You're running out of time. Uh, I have to ask you to speed up, please. Okay, so, so then I will uh, skip this one. So I just wanted to show our phase space. So uh, projections, uh, we took arbitrary uh, the first bin uh, of our uh, phase space. So it's divided in uh, seven bins. And mostly our analysis will be based on uh, uh, exclusivity cuts and what is new and we have in the text, in the text documents, uh, is that we will uh, combine uh, analysis uh, from standard exclusivity cut methods. And we now have uh, our latest studies using machine learning, uh, which also a good method to provide a better by plus by minus background rejections. <laughs> Uh, so uh, uh, here, uh, this is something which is also in the text document. Uh, so um, um, we like to say that uh, mostly uh, the, exp the uh, uncertainties on the extracted Compton for factor will mostly depends on complementary and polarized experiments. Uh, so however, uh, so whether uh, we have small or large error bars, uh, so measuring uh, this uh, transverse spin asymmetry uh, will provide constraint on, uh, on the GPDE. So our in-time request uh, is for uh, 49.5 uh, pack days, uh, so which includes uh, some parts for the setup installation. Uh, so five days for the commissioning and 30 days uh, for physics data taking. And as I said, correspond to 5.8, 10 to the 5 inverse Pico barn. And I'm coming here to my uh, summary. So, uh, so yeah, so main goal is to extract GPDE and complement extraction of, um, of uh, Compton form factor, which uh, can be done also thanks to com complementary DVCS and TCS measurement. And we newly added, uh, improved our tracking and trigger thanks to the addition of uh, GEM detectors. Yeah, so I will stop here since I'm running out of time. Thank you very much. Um, so we now come to the questions. The first reader of the proposal is Alessandro Baquetta, and please uh, go ahead, Alessandro. Hi, Marie.
the intention. But so if you go to slide 13, just to understand better, because you have several plots of this type or in the proposal, but uh, oh, it's uh, sometimes difficult to follow them. So slide 13, please. Yes, can you see it? Not yet, but maybe I am oh. lagged. It's fine for us. You will, might have to wait, Alessandro. Okay, then, but uh, I know more or less what I want to ask. So in the in the upper plot, you have the uh, uh for factors from DVCS. Those are the ones that are presently available, or these are projections from uh, future experiments. Um, well, they are. I mean. Current experiments, which are currently uh, under analysis, for instance, in uh, Holby, but not published uh, yes. yet. And there would be a future experiment uh, using similar setup in uh, Holby. Uh, okay. So that's what we could team. expect from, but, but this is from simulations. So this is not uh, realistic projections. Just wanted here okay. to, to compare what we get from DVCS and DVCS in the same conditions. Sorry? Then in the second slide, in the second line, you have the TCS uh, projections. But again, this didn't understand if these are approved experiments uh, when they are supposed to come out, or, or if they are just uh, speculative uh, projections. The yeah, second here, line. Yeah, the second line is so the first line is a bit more realistic, uh, even if it's not based on uh, uh, real projections. But the second line is purely speculative, so it rely on what we could access if we would be able to measure TCS with the same accuracy as uh, DVCS is. So it is just for comparison. But uh, Holby is uh, at slightly lower statistics, so we won't be able to get that. And um, there is a Rango proposal for uh, Hall A uh, with a solid. Um, but it will also suffer from a little higher uh, systematic due to the uh, quasi-real photon beam rather than real and a bit lower statistics at what is used for these projections. But anyway, so with, with those uh, projections, in principle, you are already statements about universality, at least provided you are able to access things in ethics. Is this the, the case or the kinematics may be different? Yeah, no, the, the kinematics are the same. Um, I mean, we can select, uh, pick up different regions, but we have a very nice uh, matching uh, area uh, of the phase space. So we can access uh, yeah. at the same kinematics in uh, DVCS and TCS experiments at JLAM. Okay, so this applies also to your proposal. With TCS, you will access similar or the same kinematics as DVCS. Is that so right? Is, yes, yes. Hmm. And then, okay, the last line is your uh, projections, but okay, what about plans for experiment of DVCS with uh, transit polarization and with other with other uh, polarizations? Do you do you expect uh, the, the the existence of similar data from DVCS by the time you finish your experiment? Um, so it will depend a little bit. Uh, so there is. Um... So, okay, so first we will be able to extract something similar if there is a similar DVCS experiment. Uh, so the only approved, similar approved DVCS experiment is in uh, Hall B, and it is uh, relying on the uh, HDI uh, polarized target. Um, so it is a conditionally approved experiment, which will all depend uh, if uh, the condition is waived and this experiment is running or not. Um, so another point is that, um, so I think this experiment from, uh, for DVCS uh, may not have a higher accuracy than uh, ours uh, due to the fact that uh, Hall B will uh, run at a bit lower intensity, uh, even if we uh, rescale for the fact that we are uh, using secondary photon beam. Okay, so, thank but you. But technically, um, yeah, there is conditionally. Okay, last question. If you go to the, to the um, uh, estimates of the asymmetry changing the value of J of, of our angular momentum. Okay, so you, uh, you, run, you, yes. run, you run those simulations uh, uh, based only on one model of uh, GPD. So what yes. happens if you change the model of the GPDs? Does, does everything change or, or not? 
so we ha we uh, I, I haven't done uh, so uh, mostly because so there is uh, actually one independent study but it's not published yet uh, for uh, having uh, pro uh, similar projections with another model. So there is uh, no yet any uh, other projections uh, published projections available. But uh, I, I, I would expect that we could have some slightly stronger difference if we use a different model of GPDs. So given the fact okay, that thank uh, you. Uh, poor parameterization of GPDE, poor knowledge of GPDE. Okay. Thank you. I'm done, Markus. Thank you. Um, Elke, uh, you are the second reader. Would you like to ask any questions? Oh, yeah, I have a couple. Please go ahead. The first one is, do the gems already exist? Or do you still have to build them and uh, test them, finance and so on? Uh, no, they already exist for the SBS permit. OK, good. Then you show this top plot, which, of course, is just a calculation of the DE, DX uh, using the equation. Time of flight has fluctuations if you have a gas gas detector. So how big is actually really your separation in uh, sigma? Because this is just lines which you take out, uh, which you calculate from the uh, particle data book uh, equations. So what is your separation in yeah, sigma uh, for this different momenta? Uh, yeah, so actually, I don't know. I believe it would be enough, but actually don't know because I don't have it. I would like to uh, get an answer to this question, please, uh, from the collaboration, because you have only three gems. In STAR, we do DEDX uh, in a similar momentum range with a TPC, and we need actually 20 to 24 samples to get a good separation. So with three samples in the gems, it sounds to me very low, and I would like to see a separation of this. Okay, so we'll uh, then, that, uh, today. Yeah. Uh, so CBUF is basically a continuous uh, beam, and you do time of fly, uh, you do timing in your trigger. Uh, so what is actually your timing resolution of the calorimeter and the hodoscopes, and then also you include the gems uh, that you can do a kind of timing compared to the beam structure. Can you resolve this? Uh, okay, so I cannot. And what timing do you need? Yeah, I cannot reply. To you this stay question, here. But there is a Bogdan online, so I think I believe that he can reply for this question. So Bogdan, are you online? If not, you can also send me a quick answer per email uh, to this question. Sure. How this timing goes with respect to the beam structure and your resolutions of the detectors. Um, then uh, for the PW, uh, the crystals, how do you monitor actually radiation damage? Because you have quite a bit of load and you will have radiation damage. And how do you deal with this? Yes, uh, so they will be monitor. Uh, I don't remember exactly what is the technique, but they will be monitor. And we have uh, some time or so, which will allow for recovery, some downtime for recovery. So you shine light on it or, or something uh, like this? I, yes, that's something like this, yes. OK, again, I, it would be nice to get a little bit more detail about this, because it will be critical uh, for the E plus, E minus, for the energy you measure that your gains are not drifting uh, uh, because of radiation damage and that uh, most to the beam you will have a difference. So you, you get actually quite some different response and it would be interesting to see how you deal with this. Yes. And then my last questions have to do with uh, your project, uh, with your simulations based on the VGG model. Uh, so your uh, the VGG model is not exactly the best model reproducing uh, actually, uh, data based on DVCS and in general for uh, GPDs. So you use this for an indication of what can happen. What I really think would be very nice is to have uncertainty bands because these models have huge uncertainty bands. It's not just a line. 
And uh, so as such, it would be really interesting to see whether you have a sensitivity or all of this actually overlaps. And then, in addition to this, uh, you make you make this claim you can test universality, but um, you have on one side the DVCS data, which are actually impacted uh, by higher twist, uh, NLO effect, and um, target mass or whatever. And then you have the TCA, which has other impacts of this because you are sitting at very low Q square. And even your masses of the E plus E minus, which could be leading to an uh, uh, to a Q square, are not very high, and so the impact is different for this effect. So how do you can really test universality in a clean way? I I, I think that is a, a would be very interesting, but I think that is a very strong claim, and I would really like to understand better how you will do this. Yes. Um, so first, our Q square threshold for all the projection of the proposal is uh, 4 GV square. So it is um, yeah. quite low, but not so low compared to other JLab uh, experiments. Um, so uh, we didn't want to make the claim of universality too strong because it is really going to be complementary. Um, so our experiment is not the best of uh, universality. Uh, because since we have the transverse polarized target, we are quite limited in terms of uh, intensity. Um, but it will be complementary to other experiments that can run at a higher intensity with the uh, unpolarized uh, target. Um, in the, and in particular, in the way, uh, and that's what I was showing uh, in uh, this slide here, slide number 13, that we improve the precision of about factor of 10 by including two new independent observables, which is mostly by reducing the correlation uncertainty on what uh, is, is extracted yes. in uh, other experiments. Uh, so now, but, uh, uh, yes. So for, uh, I mean, yes, for no, go question, ahead, please. Yeah, I mean, for your question about uh, how, we intended, how we intend to disentangle, disentangle uh, higher twist, excluding other mass corrections and uh, and universality. So it is, uh, I think, it can lead to a, a long debate uh, on how we can interpret uh, different, uh, so possibly observed uh, difference between what's extracted from DVCS and uh, NTCS. Uh, so I think uh, by studying uh, evolution in Q square in uh, independent and polarized DVCS and TCS experiment would already provide us some uh, reply uh, for the strength of um, of higher twist and uh, yeah. uh, uh, next to the order effect. So it would be done by a uh, high precision uh, independent experiment. And um, yeah. uh, so now, um, so I did a detailed exercise also to see if uh, fitting GPTs, uh, Compton form factors, by uh, fitting independently DVCS, fitting independently TCS, or uh, both reaction together. And uh, so I observe a nice uh, effect that we, um, by repeating the fit many times, uh, we would extract some quite different shape for the DVCS or the TCS or both together, depending on the strength of a higher twist effect, which is included. So it is also yeah. a possibility uh, together with a, a good Monte Carlo, uh, to help us to understand if what we observe is from higher twist or from possible uh, universality breaking. Hmm. I think that would need a longer discussion to really go into the details of uh, whether that is uh, what the right approach could be. But okay, thank you very much for the answers. Markus, I'm done more or less. Thank you very much. Since we are uh, over time, I would like to close this uh, open session. Thank all the speakers again. Um, the uh, presentations of the run group editions will start at 11.50. For those who wish to be back, uh, the uh, PAC will now meet in closed session again. Goodbye, everyone.